Ray Sweet from Milwaukee. Welcome. That's it. Everyone else is in Sarasota, huh? Okay. Jesse from Asheville. I was up there a couple weeks ago. And Ray saw a, her last rose breasted grosbeak pair in Milwaukee. Wonderful. Margie saw swallowtail kite chicks leaving the nest. Nice. Awesome. <laughs> Judith is here from Sarasota. Linda Fields from Fairfield, Connecticut saw Whippoorwill in Ohio oh, last nice. week. <laughs> yeah, so many warblers. Wonderful. Jessie Wilder, six titmice fledged from her camera bird box. All right. Gary Feltz, you're in Sparta, North Carolina. All right. Jeff, our, ho our uh, speaker tonight, a late American red start singing in his yard today. That's down in uh, Cape Coral area. Wonderful. Charles Beers is viewing from Maryland. Dean in Sarasota saw Crested Caracara on the way to Okeechobee. <laughs> Good, they're still there. Matthew Holman saw five roseate spoonbills fly overhead in formation in Sarasota this weekend. That's always wonderful. All right, Martina Venz at Oscar Shearer State Park. That reminds me, we had the uh, Scrub Jay Festival this weekend at on, ver on Zoom. And uh, things aren't looking good for Scrub Jays at Oscar Shearer this year. Okay. All right, I have uh, one quick announcement now that we've got our attendees in. Um, what? Jean says someone emailed her saying sh they saw flamingos over Philippi Creek. <laughs> Anybody seen any flamingos? Uh, yeah, Rosie at Spoonbills, right? <laughs> oh. Somebody, what, Margie? Somebody said they saw uh, a flamingo for real in Manatee County uh, flying over 75, and they were, no doubt about it, the profile of the head oh. flying east um, over 75. So maybe they're oh. heading somewhere. Interesting. One. We used to see one in Palmasola Bay, and I think it it escaped from, this was 20 years ago. They think it had escaped from uh, Jungle Gardens. Mm -hmm. Oh, so Jean says, she said she saw black in the wings. So there must be a loose one around. I don't know. I mean, I would have, I could think of one, but she said she saw several. Oh. Um, uh, I don't know. But she claimed, yeah. she seemed to know the difference between spoonbills and flamingos, but. Maybe Definitely. she saw a spoonbill in the dark and with in funny light, and she thought she saw black on the wings or something. Yeah, like maybe. Interesting. Okay, one quick announcement here. We will be. Uh, will it? Yeah, we're going to have an, a fundraiser. Um, folks have donated stuff over the years, and Sarasota Estate Auction has taken this on. Although they haven't given us enough information for me to explain to you how it works. So I apologize for that. But um, uh, they said tomorrow, if you go to the website, you'll see tomorrow what the items are. And I will send an e-blast out once I know how it works. I believe it's like a silent auction and they do it at the end, but I really am not sure. So, um, but we're hoping to, um, We've cleaned out the storage area and um, hope we can bring in a little bit of funds. So, all right, so I'm gonna stop share and uh, I'll do give you a stop share. There we go. Stop share, sorry guys. All right, so um, 
few housekeeping items. Um, most of you already know the, the, the drill. This is a webinar, so you will only see the panelists. And um, we will have a Q&A afterwards. So uh, please, any questions for Jeff, please put them in the Q&A rather than the chat, although I will monitor both. And uh, I think that's it. I'll turn it over to Margie. Oh, Jean, did, was there anything we you wanted to announce, Jean, for? Um... Um, I just want to say thank you to everybody for sticking with us through this very, very difficult year. It's been really wonderful to be able to co communicate with through Zoom. And I believe we, this is about the 12th or the 14th Zoom presentation we've had. So we've really had a rich um, itinerary of uh, presentations and I'm, I hope you all enjoyed them. Um, stay safe this summer. And we really look forward to opening up um, on October the 1st. So fingers crossed and stay well. Okay, Margie. Thank you. So I would like to welcome Jeff Bhutan, um, who has spent over two decades chasing birds as a seasonal field research biologist, a bird bander and tour leader. He describes himself as a bird bum. Boy, we can get into that. <laughs> uh, in the 16 years since he has worked as an optics manufacturer's representative, he's been engaging the community by guiding tours and speaking at 20 plus major birding festivals annually and writing dozens of birding articles for national birding magazines, the ABA bird finding guides and other random bird and nature publications. He is presently working for COA Sporting Optics as the national sales and marketing manager for nature markets. So it's my pleasure to welcome Jeff, take it away. Thanks very much, appreciate it. Um, yeah, that pretty well sums it up, bird bum. I, I've been real lucky and real fortunate, um, you know, through, I've been obviously using optics uh, daily since I was a 16 year old kid, it seems like, um, and had that experience. And now uh, as a manufacturer rep, I've gotten to learn more on the other side of optics um, as far as uh, being involved, you know, intimately with the, uh, um, processes of developing new products uh, from the ground up for birders working with optical engineers and product development people. So um, I've learned a whole lot about optics that I didn't know just through um, my field use, but at the same time, I've been able to bring a lot to them um, that they don't know as an avid user as well. Um, so it's been a good mix, but let me start off the presentation. I've got a lot of things I wanna share with you uh, today. Do this share screen find the presentation there it is voila okay so um in a nutshell there's a lot of products to choose from and trying to select an optics for you know uh, an optical device for the first time um, or even upgrading can be a daunting task you know because there's just so much information out there and this is just an example of a portion of what COA carries, um, you know, to complicate the field. So you've got a lot of choices. What I want to do today is go over a lot of the things that you need to know and understand to be an informed consumer when you go to purchase optics yourselves, um, and uh, help you through, you know, help to simplify the process of selecting the perfect optic for you. There's no such thing as the best binocular, the best spotting scope because every individual is gonna have varying expectations and um, you know, means of using this. So there's only the perfect optic for you as the individual users. And that's, that's where you have to get to, to you know, not have buyer's remorse, which is what we don't want to happen. Okay, let's see here, there's my advance. So to start things off tonight, we're gonna to talk a little bit about the optics basics uh, to make sure that you've got the groundwork you need, the foundation to include a lot of the terms that get um, you know batted around um, and what these things mean to you as the end user. You know, so that's my my main goal. Um, 
and we'll jump right in with, we'll start with the nomenclature. Now, nomenclature is basically the name of the binocular. This particular one, um, Co is the manufacturer. The BD binocular is the uh, specific line of binoculars. And in particular, this is an eight by 42, which you can see right there. So those numbers that you see there following the model um, are important to understand what that means to you as a user. Uh, this will be pretty basic for some of you. You already know this, but uh, for others, this can be brand new. So, you know, we've got to go back and start at the beginning. As you might expect, the 8x portion indicates that this is an, uh, has an 8 power magnification, and it's going to make the subject that you're viewing appear 8 times larger or 8 times closer, whichever you prefer. Um, both are accurate to think. Then it would look with your naked eye, your unaided eye alone. Uh, the 42 has to do with the diameter of the objective lens. So we're talking about this side right here, okay? You know, that uh, objective lens is the bigger end, the distal end further away from your eye. This is sort of a graphic example, just showing uh, Baltimore Oriole. You know, a naked eye would look like the orange and black smudge um, at the left, but lift a 10 power binocular as an example, and you're gonna be able to see all the detail in the binocular and that's what it would look like on the right. And you'd say, yes, indeed, that's an adult male Baltimore Oriole. I'd know it anywhere. Um, let's see, it's going automatically, stop. Uh, exit pupil, so let's talk about exit pupil. Um, uh, why are you doing this to me? Sorry. Um, the exit pupil is the diameter of the circle of light um, exiting the eyepiece. So it's that white circle you see when you look at the eyepiece. Um, it's easy to uh, tell what that's going to be. It's, a, you know, in a 42 millimeter binocular that we were talking about before, uh, you have, you're starting with a 42 millimeter circle of light. Um, in this particular model that I'm holding up here, this is an eight and a half by 44. Um, so there's a direct reverse linear proportion, basically. For every power of magnification that you increase, you decrease the circle of light coming out by the exact same amount. So if you're starting with 44 millimeters of light, you increase power eight and a half, you can simply know automatically that this is gonna be a 5.2 millimeter circle of light exiting this binocular without measuring it because it's 44 divided by eight and a half. Simpler math is on 832s and a 56, 856 would be four and seven millimeters evenly. Um, exit pupil is important to understand because uh, ideally, the best practice is you want to have maximum light entering your pupil uh, to fill all the cones and rods in your eye to have the maximum use of the, the binocular and get the most out of it. Um, so in bright light, it doesn't much matter. And every binoculars can look pretty good in bright light because in very bright sunlight, our pupils will reduce down to two to three millimeters uh, wide. But in darker conditions, the pupil is going to dilate, dilate up to five to six millimeters. Um, a little less as we age, you know, um, for those that have already received an ARP card and beyond, uh, you know, very often we can expect a smaller um, exit pupil of maybe four millimeters because those muscles get stiff. And that's, that's why as we age too, our night vision is not as good. So it's related. Um, being a mathematical formula, of course, anytime you change either the objective lens size or the power of magnification, you are going to change the exit pupil naturally. And there's all different sizes and shapes of binoculars as we've already decided. Now, here's a graphic example. These are three binoculars in the same line. This is our COA BD binocular line. And we've got, they're all at eight power. So looking through any of them, the subject that you're looking at will appear the exact same size um, at eight power of magnification. However, if you look at the circles of light coming out of these, you've got an eight by 25, which you can see here, an eight by 32, which you can see in the middle here, and then the eight by 42 on the bottom here. And you can see there's the math, but also you can literally see the circles of light getting larger as you move towards the larger objective cell. So in a nutshell, what you're doing when you're selecting a binocular uh, if you select a compact or what we call the mid-size binocular with a 32 millimeter um, objective lens, you are um, basically sacrificing a bit of pure optical performance 
to gain in size and weight, you know, and the comfortable uh, of carrying that binocular. And these are decisions we all have to make, but there's compromises in all of them. Similarly, like I said, if we change power of magnification, these are both 32 millimeter BD binoculars, BD2s, um, but on the top we have a six and a half power, and on the bottom we have an eight power. And you can see again, the dramatically larger circle of light coming out with the lesser power with the same size um, objective. There's a few other, um, uh, you know, specs that are listed out there. But if you understand exit pupil, these are really kind of worthless, to be quite honest with you. Relative brightness index and twilight factor are two uh, specifications that are basically just a different way of representing exit pupil. Relative brightness index uh, is actually taking exit pupil and squaring it. You know, it's absolutely, someone in marketing came up with this idea and said, hey, you know, the difference uh, of half a millimeter doesn't sound that dramatic, but if we square that number, it's going to sound a lot more exciting. We'll call it the relative brightness index. Uh, similarly, twilight factor is, again, a mathematical formula, uh, a ratio of um, the power of magnification and the size of the objective uh, cell. And you can see the actual formula if you're interested. You um, multiply the two and then take the square root. Um, but in a nutshell, these, I think, are not only kind of poor specifications, but they're also misleading, too, because they, by their names, they seem to indicate that um, there's going to be a certain level of performance based on this. And really, as we know, since these are straight mathematical formulas, uh, every 832 binocular in the entire industry will have the exact same exit people relative brightness index and twilight factor. Uh, the major, major difference is that that doesn't account for, um, you know, coatings differences, quality of lenses, things of that nature that are certainly important, you know. So even a $20 eight by 32 is gonna have the exact same specifications in writing as a $3,000 um, 832. But we know, all of us know if you've looked at good binoculars and, and, and very low end binoculars, the difference in performance is day and night, literally. So uh, these are kind of bad, these mathematical formulas don't really tell the whole story, okay? Field of view is one that's more straightforward and um, a lot easier to understand. Uh, what it does here in the US in particular, we use linear field of view primarily. And what we are measuring is it's, What's the width of the picture that you can see basically through a binocular? And uh, at 1,000 yards distance, how many feet can you see from one edge to the other edge of the binocular without panning? And that's going to be your field of view. Um, Asian manufacturers like Koa uh, in Japan will indeed um, also list an angular field of view very commonly. And they use the angle of this cone in degrees. Okay, so anything with a eight degree field or more is generally considered a very wide field of view. Now, a wide field of view is advantageous for a number of different things. One is it provides a lot of eye comfort. Um, and whenever you get this eye pleasing wide field of view, it's just more comfortable to look through. But also, um, if you look at the example over here on the left, um, it's much easier to find your subjects when you have a wider field of view. Now, like we talked about um, with exit pupil, as you increase magnification, your field of view is also reduced. So these are sort of the side effects, the give and take um, when you're deciding on which would be the right optic for you um, is, is the effect of increasing or decreasing magnification. And this again is a graphic example about to scale of what it would look like, say, looking through our six and a half by 32 BD2, um, which by the way, is the widest field of view um, of any binocular in the market today, as far as I know, at 10 degrees, a full 525 feet, a thousand yards versus the 10 by 32 in the same line. And you can see that in, at 10 power, you're really only seeing this section of the picture here, right? I guess here. Um, yeah, so that makes sense. It's just like a zoom on a camera lens, when you zoom in uh, to greater power, you're not seeing as much from side to side. Interpupillary distance is a lot scarier than it sounds. It's literally just the range 
of movement that the uh, central hinge pin allows between the centers of the two exit pupils, basically. Uh, that's usually listed in millimeters. And this is uh, the COA Genesis 8.5 by 44 list at 59 to 72. In most cases, most manufacturers are um, providing a, a product that will accommodate most eyes. But um, if you're trying to find a binocular for children, as an example, or if you're one of the people at the outer edges, be it very narrow set eyes or you know very wide set eyes, you still may have difficulty um, if you're in that you know five fifth percentile on the outer edges um, finding something. Uh, here's an example of a product that was actually designed for use by children. It also works for adults, $100 YF2 binocular. Um, but you can see that that interpupillary distance starts at 50 millimeters rather than 59. So that's an equivalent of about two inches to 2.8 inches wide. So that's what we mean by interpupillary distance. Eye relief um, is something that seems pretty straightforward. It's the amount of distance that you can have between the outer lens of an optic and the lens in an eye uh, and still see a full field of view. So if you take a pair of binoculars and you look through them and you pull them away from your face, the first thing that's gonna happen, your field that you see will start to shrink. And then in short order, you'll be reduced just down to the exit people, those little circles of light getting out there. So as you move your eye too far away from the eyepiece, you're not going to be able to utilize the full field of view. So a long eye relief is important, uh, particularly for eyeglass users, which you can see here. Now this also shows one of the issues um, with eye relief. This is a, um, a graphic example that I've pulled off um, the web to utilize just to show this rather than create my own. Um, and you can see that they're showing the distance from the middle of this lens to the top of the eye. In fairness, the right way of representing this would be from the highest point to the highest point. Um, but this is one of the other problems that we have with specifications in the optics industry that make things difficult. There are no uh, agreed upon uh, rules of measure within the specifications. So someone could easily report the middle of the lens as eye relief as easily as they could the top and it could you know change uh, it could be not be comparable by a magnitude of up to two millimeters more eye relief you know than they actually have compared to others so as a result unfortunately due to this lack of specifications we find that um, you can't use the written specs effectively to compare across brands and even further in some cases even within given lines within an individual manufacturer's line. So um, there's very limited um, usefulness of what you can actually do um, and what kind of judgments you can make with written specs alone. Close focus, uh, as name implies, it's how close can you focus um, on a product? And you know our BD2 line, is, which is again our newest line, our most popular line, has the shortest uh, close focus distance in our lineup for sure. And in most, the 32 millimeter models focus down to four foot three inches and even the 42s are below six feet. Um, now that said, there's another little caveat we need to throw out there. Eye relief is, uh, excuse me, close focus rather is something that's gonna vary with each individual user, even with the same pair of binoculars. Um, as you know, if you are amongst the more wise uh, and older group um, in tonight's segment, you probably have gone through the process of getting your arms longer and then finally breaking down and having to use readers or bifocals and trifocals uh, to be able to read up close. That same process is gonna affect your ability to close focus with a pair of binoculars. So a younger person almost invariably is going to be able to focus closer uh, on average than an older user. So again, we've got a, an issue with without specifications, without anyone saying at this age group or an, a mean age, you know, you could realistically represent a close focus that, you know, 15 year old child um, teen could could get, but perhaps not, uh, you know, someone that's actually a retired in, in age and beyond. Um, so there is a great amount of variation in, in reporting, um, you know, there as well between vendors. 
um, waterproof. Uh, once again, we get back to the problem with no specifications uh, accepted throughout the industry. So there really is no measurable spec you have to reach this um, level of performance to call your product waterproof. And that's why anymore in the, in the optics, it seems like every binocular from, you know, $100 on up is waterproof, it seems like. Uh, now, fog proof is a different thing. In the optics industry, when we're talking about fog proof, we're not suggesting that when you go from air conditioned uh, environment to um, a hot, humid outdoor environment that you're not going to get condensation on the outer uh, edges of your lens or conversely for those that are uh, up north in winter, you know, going from a, a dry heated environment into a damp cold environment, you know, you're still going to get condensation formed on the outer um, lens elements until the temperature uh, of that glass, you know, uh, more closely matches the ambient temperature outside. Uh, when we say fog proof, what we're talking about is that the chassis or the body of the optic is sealed uh, and purged with an inert gas, usually nitrogen, uh, which prevents the formation of water vapor internally in the uh, in the product. Um, however, you know, um, your fog proofing is only as good as the, your seals on any sp any given product. So that's sort of another challenge. Glass blanks, there's a thousands and thousands and thousands of glass recipes. Um, and glass blanks vary tremendously in quality, ranging from, you know, actually molded plastic up to extremely high density um, uh, and very expensive glass blanks. You know, the, the highest quality glass blanks generally are heated um, and, and cooled down over a long period of time in a heated oven that's pressurized as well to form a very molecularly dense um, uh, Glass is often uh, has different minerals embedded into it to uh, for different uh, performance. But generally speaking, those glass blanks are significantly heavier than the inexpensive glass blanks. So unfortunately, one of the downsides of that is the better quality optics invariably are going to be um, more on the heavy side. So that's one of the things that you need to consider. And this is just you know, principles of different shapes of lenses. We'll get into some of this later, but this is more of the physics of it. But just an example of um, the main purpose of any lens is to bend light in different ways uh, to accommodate the, the net effect of overall field of view and magnification primarily. Um, Koa, one of the things that we do, we're the only optics manufacturer that actually uses um, lab raised uh, fluoride crystal pure fluoride crystal blanks and carve a lens element out of there that we put into our objective lens cells of our promenar scope lines. Um, and why would we want to do that? Well, to eliminate chromatic aberration. So chromatic aberration is another thing you may hear. Um, and this unfortunately was a small circle that I've blown up so it doesn't have the full effect. But chromatic aberration is also sometimes known as color fringing. And what it is, is a prismatic separation of the light wavelengths when they go through glass. I'm sure you've all seen this. If you have a little crystal dangly, uh, you know, thing hanging off of your um, rear view mirror, the light will shine through it and you'll get a rainbow effect broadcast, you know, wherever the light hits after going through there. And what's happening, the light wavelengths are separating going through that glass and stacking on top of one another like this. And this is what chromatic aberration looks like. It'll generally be sort of a purpley or pinkish um, fringe on one side and greenish on the other. And they're also the colors are stacking on top of each other and blurring. Now this isn't a good example of a corrected image because again, it was too low resolution. I peeled it off our website and when I blew it up, it fell apart a little bit. But um, generally speaking, when you clean that up, you're gonna have a very sharp detail um, and your resolution will be better and you're gonna have truer color as well. Um, and fluoride is an element, that's one of the things that fluoride is excellent at, is straightening out these um, light wavelengths and causing them to come back together and hit at a focal point at a, you know, a, a closer point. So that's chromatic aberration and getting rid of it will give you better resolution and truer colors. Okay, so the conclusions, sadly, are that the specifications really aren't that useful. Um, 
and generally only usable within a given manufacturer's lines or line even at times. Uh, the spe specifications that are based solely on mathematical formulas because they don't consider the quality of raw materials, the manufacturing processes and workmanship that affect quality control, uh, as well as the various coatings applications, which make a huge difference in how much light and what type of light is transmitted, um, you know, makes them sort of problematic and, and not really a, a great indicator of true light performance, okay? Low light performance in particular. Uh, further, without the agreed uh, universal standards of measure, uh, there can be great variation in the presentation and interpretation on these other specifications. So that's the long and short of it. Don't put a lot of stock in your written specifications, especially if you're trying to compare across brands, because it just really doesn't work very well. All right, so let's move on to binoculars and in particular, um, talk about the, the various designs of binoculars and what they do for you. So again, to understand there are all binoculars should have uh, common parts um, to include a focusing knob, some form of a central axis or a central hinge pin, uh, the objective lens elements, and see I use the term elements plural, and the eyepiece and eye cups, and finally some form to adjust diopter compensation, which we'll get into in a moment as well. Um, looking at the different types of binocular. Um, there's multiple types of prism. The older design generally and simpler design is a poro prism design. And when we refer to a poro prism binocular, they're characterized by the fact that the eyepiece here and the objective lenses here are not in a straight line with one another. There's an offset. And if you look at the path of light here coming through, bouncing, bouncing, going into the bottom prism, bouncing, bouncing, and going out the eyepiece on the back side, um, and compare that to a roof prism binocular. Roof prisms are named primarily due to the shape of the prism. Um, the eyepiece and the objective lens cell will be in line with one another. Um, there's five bounces of light in a roof prism design, um, so they require a little more uh, sophistication um, and more precision to make. So they tend to be a little more expensive, but they also tend to be um, better ergonomically and, and generally the preferred model, I would say, for most um, uh, birders in particular. Uh, they also tend to be probably, a, on average, more impact resistant because a roof prism design is easier to, uh, to hold together than the offset design of these um, prisms as well on a, on a Poro. Here's a little closer look at a cutaway. And if you look, you know, this is our 44 millimeter Genesis. You've got three lens elements in the objective lens cell and what we call an apochromat lens design, which is three elements in two groups. It is designed to help reduce chromatic aberration. Um, you've got a focusing lens, which will move in and out based on rods um, that are attached to a threaded disc here and move up and down to achieve focus. You've got your two glass prism blocks and the roof prism here. And again, you've got one, two, three, four, and five um, paths of light that actually cross over one another. It's a fairly complex design. And then up here in the eyepiece, you can have as many as five or six additional elements. Uh, some binoculars may have an additional optical plane that they just optical glass for protection on the outer lens. Uh, or perhaps a field flattening lens as well. So they could even have up to two more. So there could be as many as 18 to say 22 different lens elements uh, in a single binocular. So there's a lot more going on there than you may think. If you look at uh, this, just a quick look, a closer look at a roof prism. This is uh, what we call a Schmidt Peckin uh, roof prism design because of the two gentlemen that uh, uh, developed both sides of this, if you will. Won't get into a lot of detail on that, but just a closer view. The one thing I do want to talk about before I get off on more selecting optics is a, just a straight up usage tip. Uh, I find that even people that have used binoculars for a very long time uh, very often don't understand fully how to properly set their diopter. And it's a very important thing. Uh, the diopter is a separate adjustment of focus slave to just the right barrel 
and it allows you to get uh, the proper focus with both eyes um, customized, you know, for your specific eyes. And it's, it's a real important thing to uh, reduce eye strain and to help you see better through your binoculars. So I'm going to quickly review how you do this. So as I said, the diopter is slaved just to the right barrel. Usually it's a ring on the right barrel up here, just under the eye cup, but sometimes uh, some manufacturers have it integrated into the focus wheel here. You might pull that focus wheel out and then in, you're adjusting the diopter until you snap it back in. I've also seen older designs where there could be a separate control on the distal end of the, the hinge pin down here. But generally speaking, whichever design you've got, you take the same process. And the first thing is to cover the right barrel. You can do this with your hand, um, but that doesn't, you know, it's not quite as effective as maybe um, uh, putting the eye cup on if you still have the eye cap. Um, if you close your eye like this, it's not recommended, just like in the eye doctor where they want to cover your eye uh, or shield it, uh, because when you close your eye, it actually changes uh, the shape of your retina and reduces your ability to critically focus, so the things you learn. So you're better to keep both eyes open and block the one barrel. So we block the right barrel. Step two, you're going to turn the focus wheel back and forth to get a subject uh, it doesn't have to be really far away. In some ways, it might be even a, uh, if it's a little closer, it might be even better. But something that has fine detail, you know, it could be a sign um, with fine writing on it. Um, <clears throat> if you're outside or, you know, if you're inside, you know, a field guide could work, you know, set up across the room. And you turn the focus wheel back and forth. You're going to go past focus. And then you say, yes, that's good. Okay, it's getting worse. Come back to where it looks good and stop. And the reason you want to do that is the more you fiddle with that focus wheel, the more your brain is going to try to trick your eyes by assimilating focus, and that's going to become difficult. So go to focus a little past, come back, stop. And that's just looking through the left barrel. So now your focus system is perfectly focused for your left eye. So the next step is to get the right eye to match the left, which is already in focus, if that makes sense. And to do that, we're going to now cover the left barrel. You're not going to move the focus wheel at all. You're going to leave that where it is because it's set perfectly for the left eye. And you're just going to adjust the right barrel separately to match the left eye that's already in focus. So we now cover the left barrel. And we don't use the focus ring, but again, use the diopter control mechanism, whether it's the ring here or you pop that up. Um, you just want to turn the diopter control to get your right eye matched in focus at the same subject um, and from the same distance. And then once that's done, you should be able to uncover both barrels and hopefully both eyes will be perfectly focused on that subject. That is setting your diopter. If it didn't work, you have to start all over again, go back to step one. But it doesn't take that long. You know, we're talking literally um, 30 seconds or less. And you can do that one time and know where you are. All right. Back to selecting a binocular now and getting to the meat and putting all this together that I've talked about uh, to help you, you know, just really pare this down and get to a point where you're selecting an optic effectively. So again, there's many different uh, sizes and shapes of binoculars. These are all in one specific line in the COA line. Uh, these are our, our BD2 binoculars. And here's the BD um, compact binocular. Uh, the mid-size 32 and then the 42 millimeter objective to give you an example of size, comparative size and shapes. So whenever you're getting to this point, you want to select your optics, um, the considerations, and maybe not in this order, you know, the order of which the importance of any of these could be different with varying um, uh, consumers. So again, that's a very customized thing to you too. So the first thing you um, would, or one of the first things to consider would be price range. You know, what, where is your comfort zone? Um, which power of magnification is going to work better for you? And we'll get into that in a, just a moment. Um, the size and weight. Uh, again, we talked about you can downsize the, um, the weight and size a little bit, but at the cost of performance within a given line, at least. Um, then, of course, the performance we just talked about and ergonomics. Now, the latter two are a lot more difficult to test in today's day and age uh, over the last year plus, um, based on the fact that we've been on lockdown and there haven't been events to go to to really get a, a wide selection in hand. 
but uh, hopefully that'll be fixed soon. Um, so price range, we'll start there. Uh, one of the things that anyone that's done optics sales uh, or, you know, as an, an optics expert will always tell you, you know, and um, Pete Dunn uh, at Cape May um, was the first person I heard say this, you know, over and over and over when I worked at the Cape May Hawk Watch, he'd say, always select the best product you can afford, you know, to maximize your performance. Um, it's going to be a product that you're going to have for a long time. Uh, you're doing this for enjoyment and, you know, it doesn't really pay to skimp. And we'll get into that in a little bit. Now, a lot of times when people test optics, they go and they test either in a, you know, sort of an evenly lit um, uh, store, perhaps, or uh, will go outside in the middle of the day in bright sunlight, and they can't tell a difference between the optics. So it helps to find challenging lighting conditions to see the, the differences. But some of the intangibles um, that are hard to maybe see in all cases that are absolutely true in buying a better optic. Um, and the other thing I will add, the optics industry is pretty good at representing products for what they are. There's only been a handful of manufacturers who have tried to dupe the, the public, um, you know, by presenting something as a, a Rolls Royce when it's really not. And, and they haven't lasted because the sophistication of the consumers happily, you know, they've seen through it, it's not sold and they've failed. But the two things that you're gonna get in a higher end product, one is just, we already talked about how complex the inside of a binocular is. Now, if you think about it, anyone that wears eyeglasses as an, as an example, um, particularly if you have, you know, uh, like uh, the bifocal or trifocals I already talked about, or progressives, you know, you're talking about a single ground lens and um, a cosmetic frame around them. Uh, and you'd think nothing of, you know, maybe having to pay $700, $800 uh, for a binocular, I mean, for um, eyeglasses that you're going to be see well with without eye strain over a long period of time, right? So think about now something with, you know, 18 to 22 pieces of glass in there, all working in conjunction and thinking that you're going to buy a hundred dollar binocular and get, you know, great performance out of or, or great longevity. Obviously sacrifices have to be made in the, um, in the manufacturing process to be able to reach that price point um, and still have margin both for a dealer and, uh, you know, uh, the manufacturer respectively. So, you know, um, so the durability and longevity of a less expensive pair is generally going to be less, you know, at that highest end, you can't expect that you really have sort of a lifetime product that's going to last you. Um, the other thing, though, is the light delivery. And again, in bright light, it's not always noticeable, especially uh, as we talked about before, when your pupil gets very small between two to three millimeters. But one of the, the examples that I, I use, and, and it seems like people can relate to this, it, you know, happily birders were uh, social creatures and we go out in packs generally when we're birding or used to. And, um, you know, when you're out on a field trip and there's a bunch of you all standing pretty much in the same spot, looking at the same bird. And let's say you've got a bird at the top of a tree that's backlit strongly and you're looking through a less expensive binocular and you're seeing basically a shadowed lump. And someone in the group says, oh, it's a, it's a female bay breasted, you know, or a black pole. Look at those yellow feet, something, you know, along those lines. And you just can't see that at all. That is because the light delivery, even in bright lighting conditions, or in this case, overly bright conditions, the better glass is going to be able to fill those shadows. And this is sort of an example, just using, you know, shadow and highlight on a, on a gall build turn shot that I got here in uh, in my county just the other day. I took it through my binoculars with my iPhone actually. But, um, and this is what it looked like normally. And then I just shadowed it a bit more to give the fact of what I'm trying to, uh, to tell you. So that's one of the things that better glass will do for you. It's not only good in very low light conditions, but challenging lighting in general, it will fill those shadows and allow you to see more detail. Um, plus the quality of the glass, um, as well would just allow you to see more detail and it'll be a sharper resolution overall. So these are sort of the intangibles you don't really get a feel for uh, in just testing it quickly at a, at a shop, unfortunately. Now, compact binoculars, I like to always 
throw out a caveat on, com on compacts. They're great to have as a backup pair. Um, so you can have a binocular no matter where you are, you know, uh, stuck in your purse, in the glove compartment, whatever. But I don't ever recommend, um, you know, these for uh, a primary use. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that, you know. Um, they, they transmit very little light as we saw, you know, in the exit pupil, you know, you're getting between two and three millimeters of light only entering your eye at any given time. So they're not gonna perform well in challenging lighting. Uh, you're not gonna feel near, you know, even half maybe um, the cones and rods in your eye. Um, another thing is they actually can be too light, literally like lightweight um, in that sometimes it's, it's easier to hold something a, with a little more mass and a little more size, steadier, um, if it's windy or something like that. The other thing is um, the narrow field of view. And again, this is back to that graphic representation. One of the things I always see with someone that's using a compact binocular in the field, uh, on a field trip, they're generally a person that's going like this, going back and forth, saying, I can't find it, I can't find it, I can't find it, because they've got such a narrow little picture that they're able to see, they're having a much more difficult time finding their subject. Um, and then the other thing too is they generally uh, tend to have longer close focus distances because um, in those narrow tubes, you don't have enough um, ability to bend light at extreme angles that you need both to, to get a wide field of view and sometimes uh, that comes into play in the close focus as well. Okay, so that's one of the things you give up to have a pocket sized binocular. Now happily, um, what we call the mid-size binoculars and the 30 and 32 millimeter objective lenses have become super popular and they've grown in popularity immensely um, in the last couple decades. They approach the size and weight of the compacts, um, but they have full size performance and in some ways over uh, better performance than the 42 millimeter models in the same. Even though you're getting a slightly smaller circle of light in a 32, um, they generally have a wider field of view on a 32 because the shorter barrel allows you to see a wider angle side to side. Um, and they almost invariably have a closer focus than the 42 millimeter models in the same, um, in the same lineup. You know, and this is an example, you know, this little guy here, this is to scale of our 42 and our 32 and our BD2 line. This is 18 and a half ounces and less than a five inch, you know, total length binocular. So that's one thing. Um, and that's sort of some of the nuts and bolts of binoculars. Let me get a, do a little bit on spotting scopes and we'll move to Q&A. Um, spotting scopes are a bit easier. A lot of the specifications are the same. You know, generally when you're looking at a spotting scope, um, you've got angled or straight, oops, you know what? I forgot one thing, hold on. I'm gonna back up one caveat on binoculars before moving on. Um, I'd mentioned, and I forgot to go into detail on this, excuse me. So back to the binocular for a moment. I'd mentioned select the power that's going to work better for you. Now, many times, you know, we tend to default to bigger is better invariably in a lot of cases. And in some cases with optics in particular, that's not the case at all. Um, I find, I tend to shake a lot. I tend to be a person um, who's, you know, not as steady handed. And I do much better uh, with a smaller, um, with a smaller subject with that wide field of view. Um, I can make out more detail on a slightly smaller subject because I can hold the binocular steady enough um, to take advantage of the full magnification. Um, if you shake a lot, you know, you have to remember you're not only magnifying what you're viewing, but you're magnifying the movement in your system as well. Okay. So, all right. So now let me go to the spotting scopes. So you have angled eyepiece designs and straight eyepiece designs generally is one selection. Um, if you've never had a spotting scope before, uh, the straight is going to look, you know, maybe more intuitive because you're looking in the same direction uh, as your subject is, but the angled design actually is preferred um, like 95% uh, in the birding market because one, uh, it's easier to use um, for different groups, different height people. And also um, 
it has increased ergonomics. And we'll get into some of that That's in a moment. But like binoculars, you've got objective uh, lens, you've got a focus wheel. And in the case of the, the Koa Promenar products, we have our uh, fingertip control dual focus with a coarse focus in the back and a fine focus in the front. You'll have some sort of a tripod mount. And then of course the eyepiece. Uh, like I talked about the angled view is preferred. Um, you can have a shorter tripod, which is going to give you uh, less wind resistance, uh, or excuse me, more wind resistance. You're going to have less wind impact if, by keeping it lower. Um, and it's very easy for a taller person to bow at the waist to look down through the angled eyepiece. Um, and the superior ergonomics I just talked about, and less need to change height of tripod for multiple users. The straight view is intuitive. Um, it's you know direct spotting of the object. It's easier to locate the subject at first, but that's something that you do learn fairly quickly when you start using the product, how to become proficient with the angled eyepiece. I find that disappears. But the one thing that is much easier is if you're gonna use it on a window mount, perhaps. Um, looking at the cutaway on a, on a spotting scope. So the eyepiece alone, because it's a zoom eyepiece now, so you've got some more things going on in there, has 11 different lens elements. Um, you've got a focus mechanism with lenses and gears, of course, that slides that back and forth uh, and the apochromat lens design. But all in all, you know, you're looking at uh, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 different pieces of glass uh, in this particular model. Um, we talked already about the Promenar line and uh, the use of the pure fluoride lenses um, and how effective that is. But also, you know, I need to give a shout out. Koa has seven lines of spotting scopes starting at $350, going up to $3150 of our, for our best performing. And at the top end, these are absolutely, they're winning every single independent review. And I, you know, you can look them up yourself. You don't have to take my word on it for performance. Um, the Audubon Society, National Audubon, did their scope, uh, their spotting scope buying guide, they call it. And the 883 COA was ranked the number one by over half a point. Um, and the 773 came in one one hundredth of a point behind the second place finisher, um, even though it's $1,300 less than that model. And um, our 55 millimeter compact scope, which was at the end there, this little hand size 28 millimeter, was not only ranked the best compact scope, but it was the best scope under $2,000 and was the fourth best in um, overall score in, in that review. So you're welcome to look at that yourself. Um, that's all I really have for now. I figure we can get some Q&A and uh, people can reach out to me at jeff.bouton at coa.com. Uh, you can also get us always at customer service at coa.com. We've got a full suite of products on our website that you can see there. Um, uh, our YouTube page, if you go to YouTube and search for Coa Sporting Optics, we've got um, you know, a repository, about 200 plus, I would say, videos, product videos on every topic you can imagine. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram as well at, at Coa Optics and at Coa Sporting Optics Nature, respectively. And I think um, with that, I'm not going to get into digiscoping. Hopefully, we can do that another day. And we're already, you know, past time. But um, let me stop share and, and see what we can do on Q and A. Q and A. And we already have a couple of questions. Um, where are Koa products made, and what is Koa's guarantee? Okay. Yeah. Good question. So, like. Um, almost every manufacturer out there, we have a, a limited lifetime warranty, we call it. It's uh, the lifetime of the product on the, uh, on the, um, uh, the various parts of manufacturing, um, but also um, um, it, we, uh, what was I saying? What were the two questions? <laughs> um, product, where are they made and what's the guarantee? Okay, so the guarantee. And, and it's a transferable warranty as well, unlike some other manufacturers, it's fully transferable. Um, that goes with the product, not the original owner. Um, the second side of that is more complex. Uh, all of our premier products are made in our headquarters in Japan. Uh, the lesser ones are spec'd out and made both in China and the Philippines, respectively, on the very inexpensive products that we have. We have five full lines of binoculars, like I said, starting at $100. Uh, and the top end, the Genesis 
the most expensive models, uh, 1499. Um, and then we have seven different spotting scope lines, believe it or not, start going from $350 to 3150. But at that lowest end, you know, that's literally about the cheapest you can make that product um, and still have it functional with glass lenses. And those are not made in Japan. So that's, so it's a, a complicated, complex question depending on the product, but that's, that covers all of it. Um, yes, we have iPhone attachments for the TSN 553. Um, what we are selling here in the US, we've actually gone to, I don't know if you can see this, put it in front of me. We've gone to um, a co-branded phone scope um, and COA adapters, because I find that they're just, that's all they do, you know, that is their company, they do it better than anyone else. So instead of trying to make our own, um, we went just this year um, to partnering with them. And uh, it's great because they're more effective, they offer more versatility in that on the modern multi-lens phones, you can literally, let's see if I can show this effectively. Well, you can switch from one lens to the other by snapping this back and forth. And so, and it's perfectly centered on whichever lens you wanna use. So you get full functionality of the new multi-lens phones. And the kit comes with three different size discs that will accommodate every one of our um, uh, eyepiece. This is the one that would fit on our 773, but it will also have one for the 553 in there and it will fit on our BD binoculars. And that's about $109 retail, but um, Yes, we've got a full suite of options for that to make it simple. Cool. So all you have to do is know which phone you're using and get the kit and you'll have every ring for every Koa eyepiece included. Uh, your pupillary range is 50. What would I be able to purchase? That's a good question. Um, and I would have to go and look at the individual specs, unfortunately, Ray, to know which ones get down to 50 millimeter off the top of my head. I don't know. Um, I would suggest that this would, and some of our compacts, maybe our 32 millimeters might approach that, but I doubt it, uh, to be quite honest with you. Um, I think that's it. Do you have any more questions? Yeah. One little caveat I will put out uh, as a, you know, a nice treat for everyone that did take the time um, to come and see me. If you're interested in getting a COA product, uh, we'll send you um, an email through uh, Sarasota Audubon, and we're going to do a special opportunity for you to buy uh, at a discount, you know, um, and in addition to your discount, a piece of the sales will go to uh, Sarasota Audubon as well to um, help fund the good work that they're doing there. I can't help you with other manufacturers, but I can at least do that, you know, uh, that I can make happen. So um, we'll send you an email on that. And if you're interested in getting um, a COA product, you can just respond to that email. We'll get, we'll get you sorted on that. And we'll be sure to include Jeff's contact information. In Perfect. That email. So somebody else is asking, Jeff, uh, Pauline uh, Home, Home is asking, what is the iPhone attachment application? Is it to take photos or video? Both. Uh, yeah, both, um, Pauline. And, and actually, you know, on the modern phones are getting so good that what I do, uh, I often shoot video and um, at the highest resolution, you know, you have to, it defaults to a little bit lower, but I, I step it up to a higher resolution and I'll shoot a short video clip and I'll scan back and forth to get just the behavior I wanted. And I'll, I'll select that still. And that's, you know, this Kestrel was, was just that case. It was preening and I took a short video and it did a wing stretch like this and I just I cut it off and this it won't fit in here but it, you can see the full wings up you know in the in the actual picture and uh, you know it's a really great way to uh, get um, some behaviors the other nice thing is too is you can utilize the slow motion video um, you know watching slow motion of a hummingbird at a feeder is amazing uh, and or you know even a, like a shorebird feeding in slow motion at real speed it's just dab, 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 and you can't really see what's going on you slow it down you realize they're getting some little uh, you know uh, arthropod or something they're flipping it up in the air grabbing it out of the air you know and chomp 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 and going back to it in slow motion so there's a lot of really neat applications that can be done 
um, with the phone. And the other thing too is then you can utilize the Merlin application uh, through Cornell and immediately go to identifying the bird you just photographed too um, on the same device, which is fun. So I like that. Um, th this woman who had asked about the pupil, um, she asked what she what should she do since you said you didn't know how to um, I would have to go on my website and individually look at the specs uh, and see which of those products. Uh, you can reach out to me um, via my email. Again, it's jeff.bouton at coa.com. I'd be happy to look them up um, and, and see what else we have available. Um, <laughs> otherwise, yeah, it's going to be a bit of a challenge for the folks that are on the extreme edges of, of that do have a lot of issues, I know, um, with that. Another trick that we've, I've had good success with stop dogs. Sorry, I've got, <laughs> got wrestling dachshunds at my feet. Sorry. Um, but the other thing that I've had seen done is you can go to lower power binocular, um, like the six and a half by 32 or a seven by 42, if you can find one anymore. And because you've got that larger circle of light. And even if you can't get to the center of that circle of light, you can get the edges of a larger circle still filling your pupils sometimes um, as a cheat. And I've seen that both on the wide end and the least end as another option, like on a 52 millimeter, but in a, a lower power binocular sometimes. But yeah, sadly, um, you know, there's just not many options there, uh, you know, short of say a, a double hinged um, compact uh, or, you know, something that's designed really for a smaller face, like children's face, almost, generally. Yep. Well, thank you very much. Really appreciate your taking this time to tell us all about what you know. Oh, yeah, no problem. People it's, can uh, contact you with more questions about technology. And we'll do a follow-up email with his right. contact information and the information on it. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So everybody who has um, registered or signed in for tonight's um, uh, webinar will receive an email from you, Karen, yeah. with more information about how to contact Jeff. And Okay, great. Yeah, that's good. Great. And you. also how to take advantage of the discount offer that he's offering. Exactly. And, yeah. and presumably, uh, we can include the link of where this is going to reside. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yes. The, uh, the video, so you can watch it again. Can remember things. So I did blast mm -hmm. with a lot of information. I apologize, but uh, hopefully you all have, you know, you're going away with something useful um, that, will, that will help you uh, simplify your optics choices in the future. Oh, it certainly did. There was a lot of information there and a lot, you cleared up a lot of um, some of the mysteries of some of the phrase, uh, you know, the terminology that we've all heard, or maybe we've heard of some of them, but you've clarified them for us. So that's really fantastic. So we look forward to seeing you at the Nature Center, Jeff, in uh, the fall. Uh, and uh, there you go. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, so just as a reminder, um, you can go to our website and um, tomorrow sometime I will have the, um, the, the video of this speak of this um, program will be up on our website. So um, lots of, and there's the sporting optics, um, coa.usa.com for, um, and thanks all for a great season. It's been wonderful. Mm -hmm. and Good night, everybody. Good night. Happy summer. Thanks for having me. Okay, bye-bye.